Good morning. Can you hear me? All right, we'll do that one more time. Good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. OK. All right, let's get this party started. Um, everyone, my name is Lorraine Collins. I'm the Director of Public Policy and External Affairs for Enterprise Community Partners New York. And I'd like to welcome you to the Telling the Story, How Racism Has Informed the Homelessness Crisis. I have to honestly say that you all are in for a real treat. Um, I had, and I'm going to big, big mark up this entire introduction. I had the opportunity to hear Mark speak a couple of years ago and was really in awe by the presentation, the historic perspective of where we are and why we see a number of things that we see today in the homelessness crisis, whether you're in New York City, in Los Angeles, in upstate New York, the story is somewhat the same. And so I think the presentation will open your eyes, will um, have a lot of us reflecting on how we can do things a little differently, uh, taking into consideration how we got to the point uh, of where we are. Uh, for a brief uh, introduction and overview, uh, Mark is a civic imagineer and equitable system specialist with Future Laboratories. Mark is a leader in systems transformation and currently leads equity-based work at Future Laboratories. Mark's work has focused on transforming service delivery systems to better care for vulnerable populations. Previously, Mark has served as the director of SPARC, supporting partnerships for anti-racist communities, where they helped transform the national conversation around homelessness to include a racial equity lens. Prior to that, Mark worked at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services, designing and implementing program and policy responses for youth violence, youth experiencing homelessness, and LGBTQ communities facing health inequities. So without further ado, Mark Jones, sit back and enjoy. Hey, everybody. Um, so, you know what's weird? When you listen to your bio and it gets longer and you're like, I'm getting old, um, <laughs> is what just happened to me. Um, so, uh, for those of you who know me, you know that I start um, every single presentation by saying, like, this is where you can tweet at me. And then I also say, please do not follow me if you expect to see something serious. Because that's not what I tweet about. So like, truly, like if after the presentation, you're like, I want to get more of Mark Jones, like, and it's about serious stuff, like shoot me an email. If you like want to hear my thoughts on like seagulls, or, um, which I have some, um, or like other kinds of nonsense, like do follow me on Twitter. That's where you can go. Um, if you want to find out a little bit about the lab, not a whole lot, because our web presence is very small right now, um, you can go to future.com. Um, so, in order to sort of think about um, grounding you guys out, I want to just sort of let you know what my plan for the day is. Um, so, got two sessions, one this morning, one in the afternoon. Um, this morning, uh, if you came here looking for solutions, you should come to the afternoon. Um, I really am going to focus this morning on situating us inside uh, the framework, inside the sort of historical landscape. Uh, the data around what's happening, around why it's important to talk about racial equity with regard to homelessness. In the afternoon, I'm going to take a deeper dive into what we might do uh, in terms of our systems and our responses. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. How y'all doing? Good? All right. You guys feel good about being in Times Square? Yes? No? No? I'm seeing some heads go no. I'm with the nose. I gotta be honest. Like, I just have to say, like, it's like, to talk about homelessness and, like, the epicenter of American capitalism, like, feels a way. And, like, we should just all sort of, like, be like, that's the space we're in, right? Like, I, like, on the way here, right? Like, so I, I live in Astoria now. I just moved back to the city. And on the way here, I, like, you know, pulled up instructions on, you know, Google Maps. Like, how do I get to where I'm going? And Google Maps is very helpful. When you pull up a hotel, it'll tell you the rate for staying in that hotel, right? <laughs> $950 a night. So like, ju I mean, just to a night. A night. A night. <laughs> and 
well, I'm on a roll now. So, <laughs> so, so I also just moved back to the city, right? So I've been gone for about seven years. Um, I was living in Boston, which is not a cheap city. Um, but, you know, so I, I moved back. Uh, I'm staying with my boyfriend right now, um, which is its own adventure. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so I was like, I was like, you know, well, I need to find my own space. Like, maybe we're going to move in together, but it's certainly not into this shoebox of an apartment. So, like, let me, like, you know, find a broker. Like, do the things that I know how to do, right? Um, having a conversation with this broker, like, he's like, okay, so, you know, like, what's your price range? What's your da-da-da-da? And then he says, okay, so all told, like, you know, when you look at, like, probably expected fees and, like, first and last and, you know, security, da, 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 like, you know, in that price range, like, it'll probably be about 9700 to move into a place. Like, can you imagine <laughs> having just, like, the unmitigated gall <laughs> to ask someone for $10,000 <laughs> just casually over the phone? to live in a home. <laughs> so that's where we are today. <laughs> so I'm going to talk first about poverty. <laughs> um, I think it's important, right, that when we talk about, uh, so oftentimes, right, when we have this conversation about race and about racial inequity, uh, people want to uh, dive uh, into poverty as sort of the core root cause. Um, these are interrelated phenomena, phenomena, but like as the, the data from the Spark Initiative shows, they are not actually as connected, but I'm going to sort of start to break that apart. Um, the first and most important thing I think that we should discuss is employment discrimination, right? So um, this graphic is structured this way for a reason, and it's because um, the data has proven conclusively that uh, folks with ethnic-sounding names, uh, particularly black-sounding names, uh, are less likely to get callbacks for jobs, um, to the tune of actually about 50%. So um, applicants with white names have a 50% higher chance of getting a call back than applicants with black names, um, which translates to about eight years of experience. Um, so having a white name is equal to having eight years of experience. Eight years of experience. So oftentimes, right, when we have this conversation about like uh, employment, about employment strategies, about like you know what, like how are we getting people to what, et cetera, et cetera, we'll root this conversation in uh, soft skill development, um, which is racist, um, and no, I'll talk about this now. Um, soft skill development is just super, super racist. It turns out. Um, I was going to talk about, I will talk about this this afternoon as well, but in case some of y'all have other plans, I do want to make sure that you leave with this. Um, soft skill development is uh, premised on the idea, right, that um, in order to be valuable in society, you need to turn up a certain way. Um, and I say valuable specifically because it's about being paid. Um, it is not about, like, you know, sort of larger cultural, you know, concepts of like being valued and included, it's, it's monetary. Uh, and more than it being uh, about sort of like this is how you must show up, um, those uh, ideas of how you must show up are normed on white people, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So I say that because oftentimes when we talk about soft skill development, we are talking about what? Give me some examples. Appearance. Appearance. What else? How you, speak. How you speak. What else? Eye contact. Eye contact is a really, is, that's, that's one that people love to harp on. Um, all of this stuff is deeply culturally situated. Oh, by way of introduction, I forgot to say more about me. Uh, I'm a psychiatric anthropologist. <laughs> um, and uh, so like how I approach the world is by thinking about like how do people sit inside cultures as minds, right, as brains. Um, one of the things that is always so striking to me about soft skill development is that it's advanced as if it's empirical when it's just not. There is literally no right or wrong way to shake a hand that isn't culturally situated. And anybody who tells you there is, is really selling you something. Um, and if you buy it, I have things I'd like to sell you. <laughs> um, so you can see me outside afterwards. So, so um, 
that being said, right, it's really, really important to understand, like, at like its, its base, this idea of soft skill development is fundamentally about taking young folks, particularly young, black, brown, and queer folks, and norming them against a cultural standard that is set against cis heterosexual white men. And it's yeah. about their comfort operating in spaces. It's not about what is considered professional, because professionalism is actually about your comfort in the space, right? Like, that's all that is. Um, so when we talk about to what degree soft skill development is appropriate, the answer is almost always not at all. And in fact, right, the overemphasis on soft skill development is related specifically to what careers and jobs we think people can have. Because quite frankly, and I say this every time I give this talk, um, no one at Google has great soft skills. They're weird. <laughs> they're weird people. And they're very good at what they do. And that's all that matters, right? Yes. Google pulls those people out of high school, out of college, without like, any thought for degrees or whatever, based solely on whether or not they are gifted engineers. That's all that matters, right? I have been fortunate enough in my life, among a lot of other fortunate things, um, to be good at what I do. I'm very weird. So like, when I tell you that like soft skill development is actually like a, a substitute for really investing in young people, really investing in their potential, their capacities, their dreams, their hopes, and it's done through a racist lens, I hope that what you hear is that it's time to really reevaluate program dollars that go towards soft skill development and start thinking about partnering with organizations like Black Girls Code, organizations that are functionally about skill development and homing people in a 21st century workforce. Okay. So um, this is callback rates. Um, and oftentimes a thing that I hear a lot is, um, I'm floral and short sleeve today, guys. Um, oftentimes a thing that I hear a lot is also that it's about criminal record. Um, and what I wanna offer is that it's maybe not, right? So this is criminal record and no criminal record, um, looking at black folks and white folks. Um, if I shift the axis on this graph and then compare just criminal record to no criminal record, what you will find is that white folks with a criminal record, there you, there you go, there it is, right? <laughs> so like white folks with a criminal record are at 17% in terms of callback rates, whereas black folks without a criminal record are at 14% for callback rates. So like, when we talk about like, what the underlying cause of things is, oftentimes people will say to me like, oh, well, it's, it's the criminal record, it's the low education, it's this, it's, this, it's none of those things, it's just racism. Like, racism is the thing. Hello. Um, and so if we're not willing to have that conversation, we are not having the conversation. Like that's, the, that's the end game here, right? Is that until we as a culture, as a society, as a movement, as professionals charged with getting people um, out of one of the most traumatic situations that can happen to a person, right? Start dealing with the root causes of all of these negative outcomes. We are not addressing the thing. Functionally speaking, right? We're band-aiding and we're programming. We're not dealing with systems. Um, and I think that there is, I, I really want to delineate here because oftentimes when people come in and talk about systems, there's this um, undercurrent of like all programs are trash, only do systems work. And I want to be really clear that's not what I'm saying, right? Program work is essential because program work is about keeping people alive today. Systems work is about making sure that like as we're doing that work of saying like, look, like if a person is on fire, you put out the fire. We're also saying like, what was the source of the fire? Could we deal with that? Right? So like, what that functionally means is that it's time for us to start looking at staffing arrays. I guess I am doing some solutions too. It's time for us to start looking at staffing arrays and making sure that there are people on our teams who are capable of aggregating what's happening at the program level and using that to impact systems level work, right? So there are a number of people in the audience today, some of you I know, some of you I don't, who probably have um, some role to play in doing that systems work. People with titles like Director of Public Policy. <laughs> 
right? People who are, are tasked with helping to drive those transformations. One of the things that we do not do, and I'm gonna talk about this, but one of the things that we do not do in this country, broadly speaking, is collect data on our most marginalized citizens because then we might actually have to be accountable, right, about what's happening to them. Um, so oftentimes the best data is available at the program level. So when I'm saying that like program staff have a, a role to play in systems transformation, it is, it's very, very, very real. Um, it is about your capacity to see what's happening at an aggregate level across your caseloads, across your program domains, et cetera, and then help people who are doing that systems work talk about that. Okay. So uh, racial wealth versus income gap. Um, the thing to note here, which I, I think uh, is uh, not surprising, um, is that the, the wealth, so the blue line is the uh, ratio of wealth, and you'll see it dips. Uh, any guesses on what those dips are? Fluctuations? That's funny, but not true. Um, <coughs> say it. Recession. Yes. So the dips are stock market crashes, right? Um, so uh, the, I mean, this is about capital gains, right? Everyone loves to talk about capital gains stocks. Um, Below that, though, that purple line is the ratio of white income to black Hispanic income. And you'll see that that has stubbornly been about two times, right? So in general, white folks are making, in terms of just raw income, twice what black and Hispanic folks are making. That's a lot, <laughs> right? Like when we, t when we talk about like, so if, you, if, you, <laughs> if you're like, I'm making $30,000 and that person is making 60, that's significant. In fact, I would go so far as to say there's almost no number that you can't double <laughs> and be like, God, that's just a lot more money, huh? <laughs> so, so, so again, right, when we talk about like where can we like implement solutions, what can we do, um, everyone here who has any kind of control over any kind of programming, what are you paying people? I, like, look, I, like, I... I'm Jewish, not Christian, but there is something to be said about stones and glass houses and getting your own house in order and, you know, pull the log from my eye before I get the splinter from my brothers, all that stuff. Um, so, like, if you don't know whether or not you have an equitable salary structure, you probably don't have one. <laughs> That's just a real easy take. <laughs> so you could go back to your office and audit your salary structure. Who are you paying? And why, right? And one of the things that you could implement um, around that is like, as you, and like, let me be real clear with you, when you implement equitable salary structure into a system that has not had one, some people are making too much. You will need to fix that. <laughs> That's an unpleasant conversation. But, Truly, right? Like, as you go back, I mean, this is not rocket science. Um, it's human systems management science. <laughs> and uh, you can do a thing called make it, it's a, a business case, right? So, like, for every salary, there should be a business case attached to it. Why does this person make this amount of money? Business case should include things like what is the cost of living in the area, right? What is the market rate for these skills? How, right, like, what are we doing internally to either incentivize that skill set or not? Some agencies put a premium on certain skill sets, so they'll pay more than market for those skill sets. That's all part of a business case. Some agencies are like, you know what, that actually isn't super valuable to us, so, like, we ain't going to really go above market on that. So, again, just dreaming, spitballing, if you will, I'm willing to bet a number of agencies in this room have people with MSWs on their payroll who make a lot more money than people without MSWs, and they are not, in fact, practicing or providing clinical support or supervision or using that degree at all. <laughs> so I might ask you, why are they being paid like they are? 
A skill set only matters if you use it. If you're not using it, then I could put somebody else in that job. That's just kind of true. So like, these are not pleasant conversations, but like, when I tell you they are very possible, they are very possible. And you know, I um, am very fortunate to have a, a chief of staff at the lab who is rad. Um, and like, one of the things that we talk about a lot is like, inside any kind of, like we're undergoing a, a the lab is very new. Um, and so it was like iterating right now in terms of as we find our home structure. Um, and inside those iterations, roles get rescoped. And like, if your role is substantially rescoped, something may happen to your salary. And like, that's just important, right? It's important that we set forward equ equitable pay structures internally because truly, right, like to bring this all the way back home, most of people's frontline staff are black and brown. So again, like if you like, you just gotta really look at who you're paying what. It's not always somebody else's problem. This is the median household net worth by race. <laughs> okay. Um, quick check. Why? Uh, what's the what's the deal uh, with white wealth? <laughs> Why is it why is it the way that it is? Anybody know? Housing. Intergenerational and housing. Those are the big ones, right? Um, I will talk about this more later, but just as a quick pop quiz, when did black people gain the right to participate in the housing market? Close. 68. 1968. Fair Housing Act, yes. So in 1968, that's when black people suddenly could like get a mortgage. Because before that, we had redlining, which was about access to mortgages. I will discuss that more later. But what that means, right, is that this, this, this whole country, right, is organized around the creation and maintenance of white wealth. Um, and no one else even had access on paper. We can talk about real life access, and how that's very different from paper access. Um, but no one else even had on paper access to those same wealth building systems until 1968. So when we talk about, right, like why these things are so vast and their differences, it is because of history. It's because of choices we made and systems we built. And what I'm really trying to, to get out to all of y'all today is that like any time there has been a system that's made, like you can make a new system. It's all, I mean like one of my favorite things to say is like America is all one big gross hallucination that we're all sort of stuck in together. Um, and you can just hallucinate a new thing whenever you want. Like you can just like get real imaginative and be like now it's all spiders. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't turn away a spider, spider queen. Um, I think that's particularly like resonant with me today in Times Square. Like Times Square, who, does anybody know the history of Times Square? I'm on tangents today, y'all. <laughs> Times Square, 30, 40 years ago, was porno theaters. Y'all know that, right? Yeah. Like we are standing in an old porno theater, <laughs> just several stories up. Um, the redevelopment of Times Square, or the Disneyfication of Times Square, as some folks call it, was an active, active imagination um, by a concerted group of people. And like, we are standing inside that imagination. So like, when I talk about like, the power of like, you know, imaginative force inside systems design, like, it is not a joke. It is not just like my version of the Obama hope speech. Like, this is like, Imagination builds walls, it makes things, it creates physical infrastructure that we then live our lives inside of. Shelter usage. So why did we start all this is a good question. And it's because of this statistic from 2013 that said that 13% of the US population was black, but about 40% of uh, the shelter population in America was black. Um, that had been, um, that had been sort of the, the thing that everybody cited for like, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> um, 
But there had been no real investigation of why, of what that might mean, of like what we might need to do about that as a result. And um, when you started to aggregate in other folks of color, um, that number surged to like around 70%. Um, so when we talk about bringing a racial equity lens to homelessness, it is not because, oh, new chairs. Um, it is not because uh, I'm like saying like, oh, like we need to really care about like this small segment of the population. I'm just inviting us all to do our jobs, right? Like if in any other public health domain, if you said to me 70% of the negative outcome happens inside this population, that's a no-brainer of where we focus, right? And in fact, we've done that in other domains, right? Uh, heart disease, uh, pulmonary diseases, right? Uh, asthma, kidney failure, like all those kinds of kidney disease, all those kinds of things have gone through this same health equity lens and ha it's resulted in, in focus on populations that are overburdened, right? In this case, uh, we are talking about homelessness being a negative public health outcome that concentrates in specific populations. And so as a result, the strategies we use to ameliorate homelessness need to be built on those experiences and responsive to those needs. Uh, black folks are three times more likely than white folks to become homeless. Um, and uh, black men, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that they remain homeless longer than white men with an average duration of three years compared to 2.4. Um, this is actually from uh, New York and uh, says that uh, black folks are 16 times more likely than white folks to live in shelter and black children under five uh, were 29 times more likely than white children to end up in shelters. If there's no number, that I can't double and make bigger, <laughs> I would suggest to you today that there's no number I can't multiply by 29 <laughs> and make it bigger. So like, I mean, that's an, that's an, that's an insane jump. Like to say that, that a, a black child under five is 29 times more likely to live in shelter in New York City, that, that, I mean, that's just bananas and it's criminal. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the Spark data and the Spark data collection a little bit later. I used to direct that program, um, as I think folks are aware. Um, one of the things that we did is, so we partnered with eight communities now, or the Center for Social Innovation uh, has partnered with eight communities um, across the country, um, and has analyzed over 180,000 individual client records out of HMIS systems to get a sense of um, how folks of color are moving through the system. Um, one interesting thing uh, that we also did was we compared general population to deep poverty. So that's 50% of the federal poverty line. Um, quick check. Who knows where the federal poverty line is for a single adult? Single adult is not 18. That's family. It's 12. It's $12,000. So when you talk about 50% of the federal poverty line, you're talking about people in deep poverty, which is about $6,000 a year, give or take. Um, so I just want to, like, again, like really drive home what we're talking about when we talk about deep poverty. Um, so what we found is that in Spark communities, 18.3% uh, of the general population was black. Um, that's a slight elevation, obviously, over the national numbers. It is not significant enough to skew this data set. Um, 34.1% of the deep poverty population was black, and then 64% of the homelessness population was black. This is white folks, 62% of the general population, 45% of the deep poverty population, and 28% of the homelessness population. Um, what I wanna highlight uh, is that um, poverty is not actually, and I mentioned this, poverty actually isn't the underlying driver of homelessness. If that was the case, um, I would expect, um, in fact, more white folks to experience homelessness, right? Um, in fact, the opposite thing happens, right? Um, if you look at just the deep poverty numbers, for white folks, you can basically cut it in half, and for black folks, you can multiply it by two. Um, what is uh, really important there um, is that between deep poverty and homelessness, 
there is another set of systems that are applying pressure. Um, what I would suggest to you is that those systems are the systems of systemic racism, right? Um, if I was just looking at this and saying, like, statistically, what would I expect? Um, I would expect even, you know, to say, like, a, a declension uh, with uh, white folks, I would say, okay, so maybe 40% of homelessness is white and maybe 40% of homelessness is black, right? Like, just sort of say, like, right down the middle. Um, but that is not the case. Um, one last uh, call out is uh, Latinx folks um, who uh, oftentimes are elided in these kinds of data sets. But so, uh, sorry for the slight uh, overlay there, but 21% of the general population in the Spark communities um, identified as Latinx, 23% in deep poverty, and then that sharp decline when you go into homelessness for 6.9%. Um, all of the best data suggests that that's a significant undercount for two main reasons. Um, one, as to, let's go with three. One is uh, that we believe that folks are traveling in mixed dot groups, meaning some folks are documented, some folks are undocumented, but the entire group will avoid service connection for fear, especially now, right, of interaction with law enforcement and uh, ICE. Um, we also think that um, there are significant differences in cultural understandings of home, right? Um, and the way the HUD categories are promulgated does not allow for real assessment of like, okay, so are you unstably housed or do you just live with an aunt, right? So like ideas of doubled up don't make sense outside of very specific cultural contexts. Um, I would submit, frankly, that outside of like, white baby boomers doubled up is generally how most people live. Um, and in fact, um, I, you know, some of you uh, may be familiar with this already, but um, before the baby boomers, um, most of America doubled up. Like just kind of everybody lived intergenerationally, like across different, you know, family groups. Um, and it was really the boomers that inaugurated this idea that like growing up meant getting your own house, um, where you live alone until your family constitutes itself inside that property, right? Um, all that is to say is that when you ask folks, right, like, are you doubled up? Um, like, do you live with an aunt or uncle? That doesn't translate for a lot of folks as I'm unstably housed. It translates as, yes, that is where I live. <laughs> um, so so uh, the last thing that uh, I would highlight here is just that um, the, uh, there's also significant uh, uh, data to suggest that um, at the program level, um, folks are not trained well in asking people about their demographic points, right? So like, there's a lot of eyeballing people that happens. Um, I know this because I, I worked on uh, helping Massachusetts at one point try to standardize demographic collection inside a, a subset of public health data. It's incredibly complicated because you're getting people to a, a space where they're capable of asking questions of strangers um, that they're uncomfortable asking their own family members, right? Like when you think about a typical, so how many of you um, uh, at your program do like a risk assessment as part of intake? If you do program work? Okay. Um, so risk assessments typically involve like very invasive questions, right? Like a risk assessment typically involves things like how many sexual partners have you had in the last month? Do you use condoms, right? Like what kind of sexual acts do you prefer? Um, in some particularly involved risk assessments, it'll go into things like fetish. Like, you know, like there, there's a long list of things you could do here. Um, one of the things I used to always say to folks is like, you wouldn't ask your best friend these things over drinks. So like, how are you going to ask a stranger? <laughs> like, um, so all of that is to say is that all of the things that go into our demographic collection, right, so sexual orientation, gender identity expression, uh, race, ethnicity, like the sort of extended panel that's risk assessment, is stuff that is culturally zoned, is like very taboo to discuss. And so it's not surprising that people aren't discussing it. In the case of Latinx folks, um, what we believe is happening is that a lot of uh, folks are just looking at people and being like, mm, white, I think, right? Or like, brown enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that's not helpful, right? Um, especially when you, like, you know, like because of the way Latinx functions as an ethnicity, um, so it is in addition to major race categories. Um, so, like, there are black people who are Hispanic is a thing, right? Like, we should, diasporas. Um, so as a result, again, like, people are being bucketed uh, under the race category. Ethnicity isn't being added on. Um, it's a problem. All right. Um, if you zoom in and look at uh, individual communities um, versus the United States, what you'll find is that there is 
uh, concordance, right? So um, when we, uh, when I was at Spark, right, like we ran these analyses by the community and then also by the United States. Um, so this is community five, for example. So you'll see that same trend, um, 74.8 to 64. Uh, 4.5 to 47.2 in terms of white folks, uh, homelessness, black is 6.6, 10.6, and 26.3. Um, generally speaking, what I found, uh, what our team found in communities is that you could take uh, black folks experiencing deep poverty and multiply that somewhere between two and three um, to get to uh, homelessness, and almost always I could take your general population of uh, black folks and multiply that by three and establish like right around where I would expect to see the homelessness uh, population. What's really important there is that it is the ratio, not the end number or the statistic, right? So like a lot of times I would go to like small communities and they'd be like, oh well like, you know, our uh, homelessness population is only 10% black, like we're doing really well. And I'd be like, well your general population is only 3% black, so you're not, <laughs> right? Like ratio, not number. So, and the consistency in that ratio tells me that it's a systems level problem, not an individual problem, right? Like one of the things that nature abhors is sameness. Um, that's why every snowflake is different. And uh, what you'll find is that whenever you encounter sameness in any kind of system, um, that is the result of pressure that is being put on it to, to produce a certain outcome, right? Again, in this sense, I would say that it turns out that the uh, impact of systemic racism on folks of color is quantifiable. It's a ratio that I can use to do math. Um, the only other group that has the same ratio is uh, American Indian Alaska Native, um, who are often not discussed. Um, because the number is so small, right? But again, um, you'll see, right, so in this community, 1.1 to 2.9, uh, with the United States, 0.8 to 2.5. It's that same, it's that same ratio. Um, it is not surprising that the two groups who have, uh, you know, been the subject of chattel slavery and systematic genocide might share some commonalities. Um, other things I don't talk about. And I'm gonna be very clear why I don't talk about them. Um, two or more races is not a helpful category. Like, I don't know what to do with it. Like, as a scientist, like, I'm a population researcher. I don't know what to do with two or more races other than to say, like, yes, multiracial people are out there doing stuff. <laughs> like, okay. Um, it's just, like, what, like, what would I do with that? I, which races? <laughs> Where do they come from? What do they like to do on the weekends? <laughs> um, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander. Native Hawaiian has had some consistency in category maintenance. Other Pacific Islander sure has not. So like it's really difficult to say like who that applies to and like what like when it applied to them. Um, and then finally, um, Asian. I'm really, really, really uh, uh, excited to break this news to you. Asia is a continent. <laughs> I don't know who you mean <laughs> when you ask questions about Asians. Uh, what? So like, I, like, do you mean like Indian folks? Do you mean uh, Filipino? Do you mean Chinese? Do you mean Japanese? Do you mean, like there are so many ways Afghanistan is in Asia. Like I don't know who you mean. And so like when you just say like, what about Asian homelessness? I, I regret to inform you that's a useless category. Um, and so again, like thinking about things that can be done at the program level, like you can collect better data than this. So like one of the things that the state of Mass does is they have uh, promulgated at the state level something like 40 different ethnicity categories that like people can check. And you can check as many as you want, right? You can be like, I'm Cape Verdean and Dominican. Um, what the state does on the back end is aggregate those in the epi department at the Department of Public Health to report to the feds. But what that means is that programs and, and even the state itself has the capacity to target specific communities and their specific cultural understandings and to monitor rates of public health outcomes in those communities um, without um, violating any sort of federal reporting act. Okay. Um, I put this in here because I'm about to switch um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about history for a moment. Um, and so I just wanted to give people, maybe take two or three questions right now if they're really like burning that people are like, oh, I really want to get this out before we change topics, I'll forget it. 
I forgot my writing utensil. I can't just write it down. Yes? Sure. Um, I cannot tell you um, in any reasonable way, shape, or form the number of, uh, I don't know, any LGBTQ population, really, right, that like is experiencing homelessness. There are a number of studies. Um, those fields don't exist in HMIS. Any uh, additions are made at the local level. Um, the transgender field is included as a third gender, which actually is like the opposite of how that data is supposed to be collected. Um, I think that if we look at, again, the race ethnicity categories, oftentimes there are these radical collapses. Um, and again, like, this is the responsibility of the federal government. We can do things on the back end to augment, but like, it's just, it, the, the way the data is collected is ultimately not usable. Um, and so one of the things that I think is on us as a field, as a movement to think through, and is certainly part of ongoing conversations I have with the feds around federal standards, um, is like, how can you collect meaningful data that has use, has impact? What does data collection look like? Um, we don't collect qualitative data the way that we should. Um, so we certainly don't um, use uh, the experiences of folks experiencing homelessness to drive any kind of continuous quality improvement framework. That's also quite simple to do. I'll talk about that this afternoon. Um, there are just whole swaths of, of, of ways of collecting data that we do not do. Um, and I think you know maybe this is in part the genesis point for your question, we sort of lean into bad data collection with fervor, right? So like we feel like we're doing a lot of data all the time. And then you know someone like me who's a researcher will come along on the back end and be like, 2% of this is usable, which is a bummer, right? So like, yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Yes? I cannot hear you. Cape Verdean, yep. 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 So the so for folks who couldn't hear the the comment was um, that the way that I uh, talk about the data um, doesn't disaggregate all the different ways you can be black, and that's super true. And the reason is that America doesn't care about those things. Um, I, no, I'm quite serious, right? So like when I'm looking at outcomes, if I if I look at outcomes between recent Somali immigrants and black people who cannot tell you where they're from because they've been here for 200 years, they're the same. Um, so the, the larger cultural pressures and systemic pressures that produce the kinds of, and I, I mean this in every way, like I was talking to someone the other day about education outcomes. Oh yeah, you're not catching undocumented folks. Yeah. Yeah. That's so so there is a, a general issue of just like the ability to interact with undocumented folks in across service systems now be, because of the climate. Um, I would say generally speaking though, right, that like I do not anticipate seeing significant variance if we ever solve that gap, which hopefully there's an election vote. <laughs> um, I, I, because, right, like again, when I look at, when I look at outcomes across folks who, I, who we can access, they're remarkably similar inside that catchment of folks who like uh, the American apparatus perceives as black, which is a bummer. It would be great if we could all be different things. One more? Sure. Um, be mostly black and Latinos with the social service agencies to talk about 
you know, um, reevaluating um, salaries. I want to know, in your experience, have you come across any initiatives where that would be a true empowerment movement? Because of course, often we talk about, you know, paying people, you know, um, for the skills that they deliver, especially with the direct line staff, because they have the most direct impact, mm -hmm. not only with the population that, um, that they're working with, but also in terms of being very tangible and measurable to um, the mandate that we serve. Mm -hmm. What initiatives actually gets to move that workforce to where they're, they're not on the borderline of becoming homeless and um, not being able to maintain their own um, independence in order to um, serve the population? Yeah. Um, I don't know of a ton, right? So what I'm saying is like, we need to be that initiative. We need to take initiative in the spaces that we have governance over to, 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 you know, to fix it. Um, I think that oftentimes, and to be quite frank, right, like uh, one of my more unpopular opinions, um, I have many, uh, is that um, the homelessness crisis response system um, has a fundamental accountability issue um, in that very often there's a lot of, oh, that's not our responsibility, that's over there, right? So what I hear all the time is, oh, well, I, would, I would love to pay my staff more, but like you need to talk to the funders. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't is the thing, <laughs> right? Because like if, it, I mean, this is, this, is a, this is quite frankly a question of like, um, oftentimes, uh, when you're talking, when you're at the management level and you're responding to funders, you're looking at something that's saying from a funder that's saying, "Oh, I want you to serve 700 people a year, right?" And you're like, "Well, with the budget I've got, <laughs> like to serve 700 people a year, I would have to hire this many people, pay them, you know, this low salary, et cetera, et cetera." Um, there is a conversation to be had about like narrowing our scope, doing something really well, and paying people a livable wage. Like, you know, and I think that's on management, and I've had those conversations with funders, right? Like, I've, I've both been a funder, and I have received funding, and like, in both spaces, I have said, like, maybe do less, <laughs> right? Like, because oftentimes, even, the, even like, if we talk about, like, the kinds of pressure we put on frontline staff when we say, we need to hit our marks this month, and our mark is, you know, umpteen bajillion people, it's not that all those people aren't in need. The question is, am I really helping all the people I'm touching, right? Like, am I able to provide real support? Am I able to, you know, really get this person to where they need to be in order to stabilize, et cetera, et cetera, when I have a caseload of 25 people, right, that I'm trying to, like, get through every day? Um, it's just, it's, it's not manageable. Um, and so I think that there is something to be said for thinking about at, at the agency level, um, what is your scope? What do you do really well? What could you let go of, right? How could you form partnerships with agencies who do the things that you're letting go of really well? Like I have this dream of like, you know, seven agencies and each one of them does like one or two things and they just partner, right? So like you would just have like the case management agency, that's all they do. <laughs> and they do it really well. <laughs> and then over here you would have like the housing support agency and that's all they do. And they do it really well. And then you could take all those agencies and vertically integrate them so you could put them in the same building, just like on, maybe on different floors, so that the staff could talk and like people would only have to go one place. It's like a, um, it's a fever dream. Um, but like that, that to me, right, is, is one of the potential futures that I think would get to that place, right, of like we invest deeply in a skill set, we pay it a livable wage, and we let go of the things that we only do marginally. And I think that what that means, right, is that like folks in management have to really do have to begin to think systemically, right? Because oftentimes if you think truly at just a program level, what you're responding to are the really felt immediate needs of the people you're serving who need this other thing and you don't know where to get it. So you just start providing it. And then eventually you're like, well, now that's a department and so I gotta fund that department. But rather than that, like to sit back and say, there's gotta be somebody else in a resource rich environment 
that is doing this thing, how can I work with them? How could I get one of their staff members on site here a day a week? Those kinds of partnerships, I think, are the, are the bridging mechanisms to a whole sort of reshaping of our landscape, uh, how we pay people and what we do. All right, I'm gonna move forward by moving backward um, and talk about history for a little bit more. Um, the first is just to say um, that when I first started giving this talk, uh, people would say to me, like, it was so long ago, why are we doing this? Um, and so I started including this because it wasn't. So um, America did um, slavery, the chattel race-based kind, for 250 years. Um, then we did institutionalized apartheid for 90. And we have been doing the glorious now times for 60 years. That's it. So it's 300 years against 60. So whenever someone tells you that it was a long time ago, ask them whether or not we are closer to 60 or 200, 300. Like truly, right? Like it's like we built American systems in those 300 years. And in the 60s, when we were like, oh, now everyone is a person, I guess, um, oopsies, um, we never rewrote American systems. All we did was say that they were colorblind now, which is not how systems work. <laughs> so like the fact of the matter is, is that we sit inside an America that was engineered over 300 years to exploit women, LGBTQ folks, folks of color, and like then we like throw our hands up and wonder why we're not getting different results. And the answer is that we just still live in that America. We have not done anything to systemically rewrite the backbone, the DNA, whatever body metaphor you want to use about how this country functions and what its goals are. Uh, I'm going to take you specifically through housing segregation because I think that is relevant for what we are doing. So in 1917, I'm only going to do the last century because I'm generous. Um, <laughs> I got uh, an offer recently to like become uh, potentially an associate professor, and in my head, immediately, I was like, those poor children. <laughs> they will truly suffer. Um, OK, so, so racially restrictive covenants, 1917. Uh, racially restrictive covenants um, were a practice um, by which you could put in the deed of your home. Um, who's familiar with this? Cool. Um, you could put in the deed of your home, uh, I'm selling my home to John, and John is agreeing by purchasing the home that he will not sell the home to any black, brown, Jews, women, you know, whatever, whatever litany of things you hated. Um, and um, the T is that if John was like, I actually do not care what that bigot Ted had to say, I'm selling my house to somebody else, right? The neighbors could take you to court and have the sale voided because you violated the covenant. And you know, these, I mean, because deeds are living documents that just pass you know, through hands with the, you can find these little pieces of lovely if you just go far back enough in the history of a house that's old enough to, to have it. Um, 1934, we have the Federal Housing Authority and redlining. Um, so uh, 1934, uh, we were in the middle of another homelessness crisis, right? Um, the Federal Housing Authority came into being to deal with that crisis. Um, and the response was to invent the modern mortgage system. So um, ultimately, all mortgages are still backed by the Federal Housing Authority, um, which is just really crazy to think about. Um, they are, I believe this is still true, I haven't checked in like a year or so, so maybe something has changed, but um, they were. Um, probably still are, one of the only federal agencies that does not draw any money down out of the federal budget because they own all the mortgages at the end of the day. So they're like self-sustaining. Um, bananas. Um, redlining, right, was this practice by which um, they would send out assessors to determine which neighborhoods um, they were willing to back mortgages in. Um, the process, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, right, that they determined whether or not they would back a mortgage in an area was to determine whether or not the area was industrial or whether or not people of color lived in it. Both of those were not things that they would back. 
Um, so uh, regions that were uh, ranked as uh, uh, D were shaded red on maps, hence the term redlining. Um, C ranked regions were coded yellow. Um, B was blue and A was green. Or maybe it was B that was green and A was blue. Anyway, um, point is, is that um, all of those uh, C and D ranked regions, yellow and red ranked regions, it was impossible to get a mortgage in. Um, and so fun, fun story about the, uh, the C ranked regions. Um, they were often ranked C for something that the Federal Housing Authority referred to as disharmonious mixing. That was what was in the assessor's guidebook. Disharmonious mixing. Um, which was just like people of color and white people are like living near each other and like shit could go down, you know? <laughs> um, what, <laughs> what's kind of a bummer is that like this is not um, deep hidden history. Like you don't have to, like you can just Google these things, right? Um, so again, when I talk about systems and the importance of building systems, I wanna be super clear um, that we are talking yeah. about um, federal policy not like, you know, the secret machinations of like a hidden cabal of white men at Yale. Like, which is often how we talk about these things, right? Like oftentimes we talk about like, oh, it's these backroom deals and these, you know, it's just the way that, I mean, yeah, sure. But also like people just wrote it down and made it the law. So like that was also pretty effective. <laughs> um, What's remarkable to me is that in 2018, we have not come far enough to recognize that only by going the opposite direction do you undo the damage that laws like that did. It should not be radical to suggest that there be law around the composition of neighborhoods to address this nonsense. Like that actually sounds like really just kind of regular to say like, I don't know, we segregated people into low-key unlivable situations for several hundred years, and like, we will need to forcefully redress that? That's not a weird thing to say. It, I mean, like that's, not e like, that's not even reparations. That's just like regular public policy course correction. <laughs> we could talk about reparations, but not right now. Um, in 1948, there is a um, Supreme Court decision that renders uh, those racially restrictive covenants unenforceable, um, but it's what's called a narrow decision, meaning that the Supreme Court decides that it is not the, the role of the state to adjudicate those covenants, meaning you can no longer go to the state and ask them to void the sale. Um, instead, you just need to like, burn a cross on your neighbor's lawn until they get the hemp. Um, <laughs> And it also didn't stop people from putting that into deeds, right? So people still wrote it down. It just became community policing instead of state policing. In 1968, we had the Federal Fair Housing Act and everything is fixed, please go home. That's my talk. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be fun? Um, I long for the day when we have just like solved a problem. Like that's actually like my career goal is to like solve a problem, retire. <laughs> like just one. Like when I was younger, I was like, I could do it all. Now I'm like, just like maybe like one thing and then like get a dog. Well, more dogs, I have a dog. Um, so 1968 to present, we have disparate impact of local land use regulation, which is a fancy way of saying um, that you can always tell where the new highway is gonna go. I guess like, we know which communities will be bisected. The other thing that this is a fancy way of saying is another pop quiz. What does gentrification look like? Yell some things out. What happens when a neighborhood gentrifies? What do you see? Starbucks. <laughs> Whole Foods. Grocery store with fresh produce. White people be eating good. No more bodegas. Farmer's market. Yes. You did so well. You all passed. People walking dogs at 2 a.m. People walking dogs at 2 a.m. I gotta lay down. Um, yes, all true. Um, there's a reason why, so I give this talk all over the country. 
everywhere I ask this question, that's the response. That's really telling, right? Because what does nature abhor? Sameness. If I can ask the same question in you know, 30 different states at this point, regardless of political ideologies, hues of people in the audience, backgrounds, and the answer is always the same, that's a system, right? So there is a really, like I, um, shockingly enough, given that somebody asked me to give them $10,000 to move into an apartment, I'm looking at apartments in Jersey City, and um, <laughs> uh, went to visit one the other day, um, and the, uh, it, was in a, it was new construction in a mostly black neighborhood, uh, which is already me being like, all right, what's about to happen here? Um, so I'm talking to the realtor, um, and she was like, yeah, you know, like that lot right there is actually about to be a Starbucks. There's an Equinox going in here. And I was like, the neighborhood is ruined. <laughs> because like, those, like those, those kinds of entities and the way that they move maps on to gentrification patterns in a really aggressive way. And again, right, this disparate impact of local land use regulation is that, right? There's a reason why, like, so, so James Baldwin, uh, personal, personal hero of mine, um, famously referred to urban renewal as Negro removal. Um, there is a reason for that, right? And there's a reason why we've been having this conversation since James Baldwin, is that, like, the way this process works is via the displacement of communities of color so that, like, there can be a Starbucks which you should not sit in if you're black. Um, housing discrimination. It's a thing, y'all. <laughs> I mean, like, one of the things, again, like, looking for apartments right now, one of the things that I am, like, always doing is, like, bringing my boyfriend, who's tall and white, to stand next to me while I look at apartments. <laughs> uh, you just got to think it through. Like, I'm not new. <laughs> This is, in fact, my field. Like, I'm not going to make that mistake. <laughs> I also, like, work into, like, conversation very casually. Like, oh, yes, I work at a lab. <laughs> I oversee things. <laughs> like, just, like, just, like, because, like, that's, like, housing discrimination is a very real thing. Every major study that's come out on this says that, like, folks of color are going to look for places to buy or rent are shown fewer units at higher rates. Like th that, again, like that verdict is just so far in, there's no reason to do another study. So like when we talk about like what's currently like keeping people out of housing, right? Again, I submit we cannot get to solutions unless we say straight up, an actual thing keeping our, uh, our clients, the people we are working on behalf of, out of housing is just racism. It's not income, it's not eligibility, it's just the racism. I feel like that where's the beef commercial, but like where's the racism? Uh, everywhere. Um, subprime mortgage crisis also, it turns out, fed into some racist things. Um, this uh, builds on what I was just saying about housing discrimination, um, which is that it turns out that people of color were disproportionately shunted into these predatory lending structures, even when they qualified for prime loans. So that's the T, right? Like, if I qualify for, I don't, but if I qualified for, I went to very expensive schools, like your girl has debt. Uh, so if I qualified for a prime loan um, as a person of color, in uh, the early thousands, again, the data's in, people were at a uh, statistically significant ratio shunted into subprime lending structures, um, which had higher interest rates, more aggressive payback schemes, et cetera. Um, alt, uh, uh, often, right, like the people who were engaging in these kinds of loans to begin with were people who are what we call house rich, cash poor, right? Meaning like, you got a big old house, you got no money. Um, Frequently, they were older, um, and uh, so they would, you know, take out this loan, uh, this essentially second mortgage, right, um, in order to, you know, have money on hand, um, wind up losing all the money and the house. Um, and the end of the Great Recession. Uh, that's my guy. 
Um, so the end of the Great Recession was jobless. I graduated into that nonsense. It was bananas. <laughs> like I left NYU being like, I am a psychiatric anthropologist, hire me. <laughs> and the world was like, no. <laughs> great. It was a fun time. <laughs> um, specifically, right, the jobs that went missing and stayed missing were entry-level jobs. Because it turns out, right, like, you can always give your mid-level tier copies to make and not hire entry-level positions. Um, in 2018, there's still a real dearth of entry-level positions, right? Like, the number of job postings I see that are like $42,000 a year, masters required? What? <laughs> so like again, do go home and look at your job postings. What do they say? This is a red line map. Um, this is Boston where I used to reside. Um, I, is this a laser pointer? Does this point? <laughs> No, maybe. Yeah. Oh, it does. That's not me. Oh, whatever. I used to live in that big red section downtown, <laughs> and the reason is because when I moved to Boston, um, and I moved to Boston to work for the government, right? Like that was the job that I got. Um, when I moved to Boston, I could not find an apartment where someone wasn't asking me like nine thousand dollars to move in because the Boston rental market is roughly the same. Um, and I, at the time, was making $44,000 a year, uh, and everyone was like, oh, well, you need to give me $9,000 or make like, 800 times the rent or, you know, like, whatever, um, except for in this small little neighborhood that was mostly Somali immigrants where people were just looking out for people. And so, like, there was a house that, like, a black guy owned, and he, like, basically only let it out to, like, young black people trying to make it. That was how I survived in Boston. So like, it's, like I, I cannot stress enough that like, behind all of these facts and figures and all this kind of stuff is like, just the real experience of people of color in America. And some of it is my own. Um, so social and racial inequities are geographically inscribed. Um, that's just an important thing to note. I'm gonna fly through this next section um, on incarceration just because I think it's important. Um, I feel like it's ir irresponsible to talk about racial justice and homelessness in 2018 without briefly touching on criminal justice. Um, so we have a cycle of criminal justice involvement and homelessness, right? So there's the criminalization of homelessness, law enforcement, prosecution, and sentencing policies, um, and then inadequate reentry, and then collateral consequences. We also just have the hyper predation of this system on communities of color. Those uh, powers combined create captain yeah. injustice. Um, that was a Captain Planet joke. You guys should have laughed. Um, of the 11 million people detained or incarcerated in jails every year, 15% um, report having experienced homelessness, um, and about 50,000 people entering shelters every year are coming directly from prisons or jails. That's a crazy number. Um, and I think what's, uh, what's scary to me is like more people are, are just vanishing, right? Like, there are a whole bunch of people who are not going to shelter, are not going um, to you know, uh, an apartment or to family or wherever. They're, they're just vanishing. So presumably, they are experiencing street homelessness. Um, and that's, a, that's, that's scary, right? Um, one of my uh, colleagues, Jeff, talks about how if we really get to where we're headed on de-incarceration, um, we don't have a system in place for where those those people will go. Um, it'll be like when we deinstitutionalize the mental health system. It was a really good idea. Like no one's trying to put those hospitals back in place. But the problem is, is that during that movement, we talked real big on community-based support systems that we didn't build. So like we were like, nah, you just let everybody out. We got it. We the community. We like we're just ready for them. We were not. <laughs> 
And as a result, and, and there was no, I mean, like, you want to talk about, like, phased implementation plans, which is a thing I like because I'm a bureaucrat. Um, like, there was a way to do that that involved, like, moving money slowly over years, right, from those large institutions into communities to build out the capacity so that, like, as you started phased releasing people, the capacity to meet them was already there. It's, again, not rocket science. It's implementation science. Um, but we didn't do that. And we're doing the same thing right now, right? Where we're like steady beating this drum of like the community can do this, the community can do this, the community can do this. And like, I don't think the community can in its current configuration. We don't have the resources. 30% um, uh, of uh, folks of color uh, make up the US population, 60% of those imprisoned. Um, one in three black men can expect to go to prison in their lifetimes. Um, mm. Um, and the number of women incarcerated has increased by 800% since 1980, and women of color are three times more likely to be incarcerated than white women. Um, this graph uh, shows, right, like the racial health disparities in prison. Um, so you have black 15%, 40%, um, and then white folks 64% to 39%. What does that look like? Oh my god, it's the same. What does nature hate? Sameness. Sameness. What does this tell us? Systems. <laughs> like, th these two graphs should not look the same. These are ostensibly very different things, unless they aren't. <laughs> Everyone go watch 13. <laughs> it's very good. Um, Michelle Alexander says, you know, what is painfully obvious when one steps back from individual cases um, and specific policies is that the system of mass incarceration operates with stunning efficiency to sweep people of color off the streets, lock them in cages, and then release them into an inferior second class status. Um, I think it's important to make sure that we are always listening to uh, folks with lived experience. Um, I have experienced a lot of things in my life, but not homelessness. Um, and I wanted us to hear um, particularly some of those voices today. What about since having a record, was it harder to get a job? That's, that's that's a big thing. You know, of course, it's hard to get a job because they set a lot of a lot of rules and regulations where you commit a crime, certain jobs you can't get, and that's be some of them good high-paying jobs, professional jobs that where people want to treasure around money, or very expensive properties and stuff like that. We can work in the penitentiary, in the factories, uh, <laughs> even fight fires and stuff. You know what I'm saying? And then you come out, you're not trusted now, you can't be no fireman, you can't work in these factories. Wait a minute, I did all this work for 13 cents an hour in a pen, you know, doing mattress factory, furniture factory, all these state buildings that got furniture, we put them together. You do laundry, with PIA laundry for mental hospitals, for other institutions, and you know, license plates and press license plates in Folsom. And, you no know, detergent plants, all this stuff that, that you qualify, they train you to do, then you get out here, they won't hire us right. for the real money. Right. So, and then they, they scare the public to believe everybody that, that comes out, out of prison shouldn't be able to get a job. You don't have no good credit, you know what I'm saying? So, they don't mean you have bad credit, it's just that you never establish no credit, you know? so. When people when you try to get in housing and stuff like that, they're not just doing a background check on you, doing a credit check on you. This is what I find is a barrier. Okay, I was here, I've been here, and um, I had, for my home, homelessness situation, I had got a housing voucher that uh, helps you, like, you go out and you find a place, try to find a place to live, and you know, it's, it's low income. Well, that didn't work for me because they went back to, um, you, it's like you can't live, they, they won't rent you a place to live because you have a felony on your background. So for me, I wasn't able to use that voucher because every place that I went to turned me down because of the the one felony that I have, which I went to prison for on my record.
forgot to mention. So uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, I did run uh, Spark at the Center for Social Innovation for a number of years. And um, in that work, um, in addition to partnering with eight jurisdictions, we also collected over 171 oral histories from folks of color experiencing homelessness, did 21 focus groups, and then, as I mentioned, looked at over 180,000 individual client records from HMIS. So when I talk about what we should do and what we know, it is because we researched it. Um, it's not my opinion. It's not like, oh, here are some fun things I could say to you guys. Um, it is because I'm a, a researcher, um, and I believe in data-driven policy and data-driven approaches, and I also believe we do not listen to the people who experience what we need to be fixing. Um, I am always heartbroken um, by that, that first. So that, that's from the Spark data. Um, uh, that was my deputy. Um, uh, previous Stephanie, in the, in the uh, first clip asking the question. Um, and I'm always heartbroken by that response of, um, I just wanted to do the same things they taught me to do in the pen, right? Like, how remarkable to be trained in multiple things and then told you cannot do them unless you are a slave. Um, I also think, again, I want to uh, disabuse us of the notion, you know, there's that, that uh, you know, prison just you know, makes better criminals. Um, that's not true. Uh, we actually have a lot of programs in prison around skills building, around skill development, um, hard skills actually, not soft skills. Um, and we uh, have no problem deploying folks to run call centers, to build, um, to be part of public works. Um, but we will not allow them to continue that work when they are no longer incarcerated. Um, and so it is not that we don't do that work, it's that um, we make a conscious and deliberate decision to ensure that that is not a pathway to economic security when it is no longer benefiting the state. Um, we got some time for questions. Um, I uh, am Mark Dones. Um, that's my email if you ever want to talk, mark.dones at future.com. Um, again, that's my Twitter. If you have questions about the Spark work specifically, um, you should reach out to the team at the Center for Social Innovation. Um, I'm happy to speak historically about what we did, obviously, but um, any kind of you know ongoing work, I no longer oversee. Um, that's all. So I tried to forewarn you. I told you you were in for a special treat. Um, also, just with the, the realness and some facts and figures and the historical perspective that um, even at the show of hands when Mark had asked, that oftentimes we either overlook um, or we just don't know. And so with that, in turning it over, first, uh, if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, if not, I do have a couple that I'd like to at least engage a conversation. But I'd like to start with, from the second portion of Mark's presentation, any questions, thoughts, reactions? Nothing? Oh, oh, there we go. And could you, if you can't speak loud enough, if you could please come to the microphone. Okay, thank you. Louder. Thank you. Really start when every one of us 
goes to work every single day and we keep doing the same grind, but we want the state to make a change. Where does the change really start? It starts with everyone sitting in this room. Everyone. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> Do take that to heart. <laughs> and come to Albany for our MC. I'll put all, you know, we want to change the state. That's kind of what the network is all about. So. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is the power to vote, the freedom to vote that many fought for, died for, and exercising that power and uh, rallying around candidates that we can trust when they're in office that they will be the voice of the community and they will, yes, push things forward. Um, one question comment somewhat related or an extension of that that I want to pose to Mark when you were talking about Times Square and as we you know, leave this room and continue throughout the rest of the conference and then go back to our respective communities, when we're talking about imagination mm -hmm. and imagineering, if you could give us a few thoughts on if someone was able to imagine Times Square from the days of the porn theaters to what it is now, what can we imagine for our communities, mm. for our homes, for our neighbors, for our families mm -hmm. that we can take back and actually put into practice? Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is on? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, oh gosh, a couple things. One, come this afternoon, because I really, I'm really gonna lean into that space. Um, some things that I think are really, really important um, and to, not to bury the lead, um, I'm going to talk this afternoon about like about just cash transfer, about debt buying, about direct relief. Like that's where I'm really putting my attention now, um, because if we don't re-engineer our relationship to capital, our relationship to wealth, we will die in it. Um, and that I think is within our power, right? Like the, long ago, in times of yonder. Um, we did that already, right? Like communities would pool resources to buy, buy people out of debt, to make sure that people had a place to stay. Um, that increasingly, um, even the ability to do that has been sucked out of communities, right? We need to get back to that kind of power. Um, part of that has to be in just how we interact with each other, how we look out for each other. But another part of that does have to be thinking about how we use the resources of the state because the state has vast resources. And by state, I mean federal, I mean actual state, I mean municipal state, I mean the state. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, we have to start building our programs, our policies, our, our, our built physical spaces um, from the perspectives of people who are the most marginalized. Um, meaning that like to truly do equitable work means that rather than centering, um, you know, you know, my experience, like I'm a, I'm a non-binary person of color, like I got a lot of stuff going on, people have it way worse than me. <laughs> Um, that's who I need to be thinking about when I do my design work, right? So I often ask myself, right, could a disabled trans woman of color make it through this space safely? If the answer is no, I got to do better on the space. Um, because like, I, I look for, like truly look for, like where do vulnerabilities cluster? Um, and then how can I build something that does the best it can for that person? Because that means that everybody else will be safe, right? Um, the best example of this continues to be curb cuts. Um, I say this a lot, right? But like curb cuts didn't exist before the Americans with Disabilities Act. We take them for granted now, but they are a recent invention. Um, the ADA was put together and passed on the advocacy of people living with disabilities in modern American cities who said like, yo, this shit is low-key highly unnavigable, right? <laughs> um, and so, I mean, that's what it was. <laughs> and um, the invention of curb cuts was so that folks who had walkers, had wheelchairs, et cetera, had canes, right, could, could navigate getting on and off the sidewalk safely. Um, what that meant, though, was that suddenly people pushing strollers, people making deliveries, people looking at their phone because they're very distracted, uh, suddenly weren't falling and breaking their necks, right? Um, 
everybody benefited by reorienting the urban landscape so that it could be inclusive of folks uh, living with disabilities. That's what I'm saying when I say, like, let's build a system that works for a disabled trans woman of color, because, like, those categories are the categories inside which vulnerability nests. And if we do right by those folks, everybody will experience society as more functionally navigable. Um, last good example of this is like the regulation that standardizes like where a light switch is when you enter a room is also the result of work uh, by disability advocates, right? Um, how many times have you walked into a dark room, groped for where the light switch should be and found it? That was the work of somebody, right? And we all benefit from that. I was in a pre-war the other day. I went to find the light switch. I was lost for an hour. I could not, could not find that mess. It was like high, it, truly, it was high up on the ceiling next to the light. Why would it, why would you do that? That's my answer. <laughs> Well, on that note, again, if we could give Mark a round of applause, please check out his presentation this afternoon. Thank you.